Welcome to Press Review, the show with reaction where we review the stories that have caught our attention in the last week or so. I'm Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. I'm joined by uh, my colleague Alistair Ben from uh, Reaction. Alistair, what's your first pick of the week? A story from The Guardian, I think. So, yeah, it's Andy Beckett, um, who I think is well known for writing a book about the 70s and uh, a sort of shortage of Britain. Um, and he's written a piece called The Conservatives Are in More Danger Than They Think. I thought it was a good piece for two reasons, in that it, well, one reason was that it chimes with my own thinking about what the actual point of danger is for the Tories, because I think over the last couple of months, people have sort of had the vague sense that there's this vague sense of arrogance um, at the top. There's, an, there's a sense that Boris, his leadership style is not maybe one that's suitable for crises. Um, and yeah, the piece basically argues that you know, what, what could really damage them is a kind of cascading shock that just kind of, you know, to quote Tony Blair, kind of puts the kaleidoscope in whatever he yeah. said, the kaleidoscope, the kaleidoscope has been shaken. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so I think people are, my own thoughts about that is people have misread the last couple of months and that they've basically argued that the problem is um, Boris doing stuff like raising national insurance or creating a new yeah. levy. But I think that's actually overstated. People generally accept a tax rise like national insurance if it's for something they want to have happen. <laughs> like, yeah. And health and social care, um, you know, people people want the health service to be better funded. Yeah, there's a logic. There's a logic to it also, isn't there? After after the pandemic, that people. I mean, I'm personally opposed to it. I think the last thing the government should be doing be hiking taxes at the moment because it sends the wrong the wrong um signal to investors and to uh, to consumers but you can see the logic i mean i in, in two minds about this um this question about the tory poll position you know how robust is it because in a way the tories can't believe their they, they can't believe their their you know their, their luck they're still and it but it feels a little bit like it felt after northern rock for example when I think you know Labour things calmed down and Labour I think still had a poll lead or Labour was still something was going wrong with the financial system but it wasn't yet the explosion of um, autumn two thousand and 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 eight so is it a moment like that uh, or is it um, you know and are they as Andy Beckett says you know about to be hammered just by this as you said you, as you said you know, this cascade of calamity on energy um, prices fuel that sort of thing but then the, the 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 advantage that the tories have and it does is their lead which would suggest the lead is solid is that because boris reunited the brexit vote at the time of the 2019 election essentially just adding on top of the of the tory vote the brexit party vote which had which was you know had had uh, was a rebel a rebellion against the political class that gets them to about 40%, doesn't it? And, it's, yeah, and it's, so it, yeah. it seems that no matter what you throw at those voters at the moment, they have made made up their mind to sort of generally just let the government get on with it. Yeah, so it's sort of deep structural things on his side, but that, you know, all of that is true until it isn't, you know, kind of sh shocks like that, like the financial crisis or shocks, you know, the, the energy shock that is going on in the world economy, whatever Boris burbles about it, just being the world economy waking up, or uh, you know, it's just growing pains. It's that, that I, is not plausible to me. The economy, yeah. it's a delicate, you know, complex modern economies are delicate, intrinsically fragile and delicate, and rely on a very delicate balance of confidence, consumer confidence, of people making decisions, of good leadership and strong leadership. Uh, you, yeah. you know that better than me through your writing on RBS and, and financial shocks. You know, the, like, the, it is a very, very unstable situation at the moment. And it yeah. has really struck me. And again, this is just a, potentially being a commentator on this sort of issue 
you overstate things. There's a tendency to overcorrect after the pandemic and maybe be more doom and gloom than maybe in I certainly was in February last year. I just thought, well, it's going to blow over or something. But it just seems to me like there are so many sort of warning signs going off. And who yeah. do you want in charge? I mean, Boris in the last crisis, it is obvious that he cannot, he's he's very bad at crisis management. And, whatever, and, and actually, whatever good people are around him are affected by uh, his whatever it is, his chaos, his inability to focus, all the kind of leadership problems that have been stacking up. What, why it doesn't resonate with, resonate with the public in the same way as, you know, th- things are often crystallised, you know, over time. With Gordon Brown, it was crystallised very quickly, as we've seen with things like the yeah. Blair Brown. You know, it was almost, he, he went from this sort of strong figure to someone who was seen as very weak and indecisive, quite quickly that's, tr- that's true but then but alistair people don't then uh i mean i think it's a good set of questions posed by um you know by by andy beckett but people don't follow politics in that way do they they don't so they, most people most voters think about politics every few years and they were forced i wonder if this might be a, a side effect of brexit they were forced to think about politics because it was just so dominant during the the, the brexit you know that disastrous um period before the 2019 election they were forced to think about about it more than they would normally like to and i wonder if there's just a bit of a backlash against that that they're that they're tuning out so i will um and just letting the government um get on with it for my first choice i've actually rather than the show's called press review and of course we review you know newspapers, magazines, podcasts, stuff that's uh, grabbed us from around the world. Um, But Twitter also counts. And I was very struck this week by uh, the the way in which the story played out on Twitter on the UK and the Northern Ireland protocol negotiations or uh, crisis, if if you like, with uh, between the EU and the UK. The way in which the initial reports came out saying EU offers major concessions, deal must be in prospect. And a, a couple of Twitter threads emerged, which caught my eye, which gave a, a really good insight and analysis. And so the first one was Anton um, Spisak, who works for the Tony Blair um, uh, Institute. And he had a really interesting um, thread where es- essentially he acknowledges that the, the the EU has made some concessions, will be seen as a small victory by many in London. Uh, uh, remember that the big philosophical argument with the EU has been on the extent to which flexibilities like this were possible at all. So this is what fascinates me. Most of what the EU has conceded used to be termed magical thinking. I mean, there was no, po- there was no possibility of such flexibility, but now it seems that it is, which raises the question about whether the UK government is doing the right thing or the wrong thing, the right thing, I would say, by, by actually um, negotiate, by pushing things quite um, hard. But he raises the point that it's, although there are concessions made, once you actually dig into the, the, um, the practicalities of it, the point also made by uh, Raul Raparel, who's a former um, uh, UK government advisor, who makes a similar series of points about actually once you get into the detail, you see that there's all sorts of areas where the EU hasn't moved that are still going to be problematic, for, certainly for the unionist community in, in Northern Ireland. Um, Anton Spisak says, most notably on customs proposals introduce a new idea of structural safeguards, things the UK could do if the UK doesn't comply with um, you know, obligations here, no changes to the VAT system. So you're into the absolute, you know, the, the weeds on things like medicines as well and which medicines are allowed to be, you know, do they need the um, approval of uh, EU regulators uh, as well? Um, and essentially it says, but the conditions for the UK are pretty strict. Ongoing application of the relevant EU legislation and enhanced surveillance system. I mean, I think what's now about to happen is your David Frost, as we record this, is in is, is in Brussels. Negotiations are about um, to start. They think probably through uh, pro- probably leading to three or four weeks of talks. But I just thought it was noteworthy. That with a you know with a there's a couple of examples there of people who are following this very closely and uh, the, the 
the links to those Twitter threads are are below. Your next choice, Alistair, is um, I think actually from uh, Engelsberg Ideas and related in a, at a tangent, but related to this question of um, EU UK relations, but through the prism of what's going on between uh, Britain and France. Yeah, so um, I asked James Barr, who's a uh, brilliant historian, um, uh, and a historian actually of the Middle East and the Anglo how the Anglo-French relationship has played out there in part. Um, but I asked James to write a sort of essay on um, the Anglo-French relationship over time. Um, and his point is uh, that it's a very, it's always been a testy relationship at times kind of infuriating to both sides. Um, but when the chips are really down, there is a kind of coming together. So, mm. and the clever point is, well, we, you know, that we kind of don't need to worry <laughs> about the kind of squabbling at the moment because the chips are not quite down. But when Britain and France come together, then we need to think, oh God, <laughs> you know, things are actually really bad. Yeah. Um, and it's a brilliant essay because it kind of, it takes you through all the kind of different inflections of the relationship and the, actually the paranoia actually it really struck me that has sometimes been a real feature on both sides of the channel you know in the early 20th century there was huge paranoia on on in England about a potential French invasion there was paranoia in France throughout the whole 20th century about Britain's role in the Middle East um, and you know a lot of interesting he puts a lot of great anecdotes in um, what you know why that I think it's important to sort of why I commissioned it actually was because there's an awful loss of trite being talked about the Entente Cordiale and the Lancaster House agreements and, and there's this kind of notion that Anglo-French relationship is now in such a dire state it was in a it was in a relatively good state and now we're in this kind of real nadir we're not maybe not quite trite and there's a certain truth to it but I think people need to get real and have a bit of a more long a long view on this you know mm. there are there is going to be strategic competition between Britain and France there are different strategic interests at play in Europe in other hot geopolitical zones across the world there have been so many signals on the French side that they wish to take a different view for, uh, for example on China which is the defining geopolitical contest of our century yeah. so I, I don't buy this idea that it's Britain sort of sailing off on its own and trashing its alliances and you know there's this other reality where Britain and France are sort of collaborating all the time talking lockstep I'm sorry you know we have both countries actually have signaled over quite a long period that that you know there is going to be huge collaboration on defense issues on that kind of material side of things but there is going to be a different take on yeah certain but issues this, there and is that's, this, it, and that's it's a, fine it's a yeah it's a really good piece by james if you're watching this and you're um uh, and you you haven't yet seen engelsberg ideas ei which is another site that alistair and i um uh, work on that the reaction uh, team helps to helps to produce the address is below you can also subscribe and you get a weekly email which is free um so, so tune in and read read uh, um, read James's excellent excellent essay. But the, there is this weird uh, duality, isn't there? That the, the the French and UK relationship is just happening on two levels, as you described. It's it it is on on a day to day basis in terms of defence cooperation. We've talked about it a lot before. There's tons of cooperation, and the two nations armed forces are effectively interwoven uh, and share capability. And that pooled capability makes both stronger. But then politically, the relationship between Boris, which you know, James alludes to, between Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron seems to be completely broken. And people I speak to say that it seems unfixable. And it is, it, it, it's odd because it, their relations, relationship started out being very positive. I know that sounds odd, but Macron found him obviously much more entertaining than uh, Theresa May 
and could talk to him in French about French history. Boris likes French wine and found the whole thing, found him amusing and interesting, but also quite a serious thinker on, on, on geopolitics. That was Macron's first initial take on him, which is then soured because of the, the, the mess of Brexit, uh, the Brexit talks, and then AUKUS, in it, and it now seems it now seems as though they just don't they're not communicating in the way that they they were and the relations are in the deep deep freeze. It'd be interesting to see whether there's some act of statecraft which can can fix that, or whether that's just how it's going to run until uh, until um, until Macron stops being president or Boris stops being prime minister when, whenever that is. My next choice is uh, just I just want to flag this up and the the link is below just because I thought it was a very powerful. Uh, contribution from Professor Robert Winston uh, on BBC Question Time this week, where the, um, the, the the thorny question of trans rights and the debate over what's been happening is Kathleen Stock at um, uh, at, at uh, you know at, at Sussex University in the last um, the last week or so. So it's very much a live issue. But he, and the, as I say, the link is below. Just gave a very clear explanation of how which seems to me at the heart of it that if if you are if you want if you want a, a resolution to this or a, 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 an intelligent way to think about it which doesn't lead to conflict it is that of course people can change their their gender um but that the the biological sex is sort of, you know, is is unchangeable and he he says that in a very crisp and clear and calm way and then says but even the act of saying this on on um, BBC Question Time means that he will then get you know, a torrent of uh, torrents of hate mail. So I just wanted to, to flag that up. Your next choice, Alistair, I think is from the New Statesman. Yes, it's Jenny Clayman, who's written a great long read on the anti-aging industry. Uh, and the title is Immortality Inc., born in Silicon Valley, the anti-aging industry is booming, but who wants to live forever? Well, it turns out quite a lot of people do want to live forever, um, quite amazingly to, to any reasonable right-thinking person, quite frankly. And you read this, it's a great piece because you interview all these you know, really clever, they're very clever scientists and they're working in these you know, cool startups. They've got backing from these billionaires like Peter Thiel and all the mood music is, you know, no one's ever going to die of cancer again once we've changed it. No one's going to die of Alzheimer's again or, you know, or die with Alzheimer's. And the idea really is this, and it's very well illustrated in the piece, is that while death is inevitable, ageing isn't. So it's saying that, um, you know, we might die eventually, but you don't have to go through the ageing process to get there um in fact we have a you know over the next 20 or 30 years there'll be a we'll develop all these kinds of interventions like prophylactic drugs for yeah. aging so you'll take a pill like a, almost like a statin um that regenerates your cells in some ways or you know just stops the aging process um and um you know and then there's a very funny sort of sceptical view put by an academic, which just says, well, these people are, have not thought about what they're doing. Um, you know, it's like, you know, you're, what happens in a world with three billion, a hundred year olds who definitely don't want to work anymore, <laughs> but just want to watch Amazon Prime <laughs> and consume, have nice food or whatever people want to do at that age. Well, yeah. you're going to, have a situation you know not quite Malthusian but it's not going to be a happy world and you know in that society what, what what's the point of dynamism if you've got all the things that you've always loved you're not going to want new things yeah and there, there's just so many things that sort of I, I just you read this stuff and you just think to these sort of young scientists or these you know west coast types just read some honestly just read some books Read literature about dying. Read like Turgenev or Tolstoy or Greek tragedy or uh, the myths, you know, Prometheus and the curse of <laughs> the curse of knowledge or the curse of, mm. um, you know, the, you know the, the, the curse that we all live with, which is 
you know, that we are alive and that we are constantly transgress, trying to transgress our limits. And, you know, those kind of the limits that are put on us find a funny way of getting back to us. And it's just like yeah. all that, those messages, I just think they'd all do sort of enjoy, I think, having a bit of time with yeah. the humanities, all these anti-aging it's, types. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a really good, good piece. Of course, the, the, the problem is that when, I'm, you know, I can remember being your age when it all seems very distant <laughs> and then and then I have to say as time passes I mean it's probably too what you described it's probably too late for me but you um time passes and, and actually you think well you know when you get get into your 50s and 60s um this all seems you know frighteningly uh, frighteningly close also but Ian, Ian you'll be fine and you're it's still fine for you it, well, let's hope so. But the, the, in the um, piece, he says so. It's in your forties and fifties. It's you, they're going to be drugs in like fifteen years, where all the aging processes are. And we all live to one hundred and fifty, and you know. But is you, so that raises a that raises a question though. The piece raises a question about what's a model of the of the economy can can support this, because I think there will be people who want to work into their. There are now people, many people working into their 70s and some people starting, you know, some people working into their 80s now uh, as well. And with no desire to, um, or inclination to, to give up. So I, th I think when you couple that with what's happened with the, the, the birth rate this week, which the latest ONS figures show it's, 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 it's down um, and you know, it's falling in the UK, which is really, a troubling sign for a society and and, and an economy um, because it needs to it needs to regenerate itself though I suspect the UK economy once you get over the the brexit um, difficulties of the moment I suspect that the UK will go will go back to being post crisis a pretty high uh, immigration uh, economy so I, th I think the population will be replenished that way but we'll see that brings its own stresses and um, stresses and strains but as you say did you just you say three three billion people globally of a hundred that's the that's the, the prospect but then also if you so kind of is, is the what, but you're right on the that's the most interesting bit actually is how you think about those that in terms of econ economics and it's like surely you just get into a position where you have an underclass of people who have to work manual jobs until they drop who definitely cannot afford these new wonderful therapies but that's that's for the next 100 you know there's no way these kinds of therapies get distributed at cost to the whole world you would have a sort of normal age limit world where everyone makes everything for these 110 year olds you can't let's be honest are probably going to have their cognitive skills but they're not going to you know, you're not going to be able to do heavy labor or it's not going to be self-sufficient so it just i just think they all need I'm to 50 just... i can't even do that now but yeah, <laughs> but yeah. They just need to take just have a i just think bright-eyed americans in general just need to look at the kind of look at the woes that have been wrought in the world by other bright eyes idealistic americans whether that's you know wherever i mean lots of great things a lot, but, but a lot of bit... overreach <laughs> But that is for all the doom and gloom about America. That is that is the, it is an optimistic, yeah, culture, isn't it? It it it, it is, uh, because it maybe because it's newer, but it it is just gripped with the gets these notions and gripped by these exciting um, ideas. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button below this video, and also, it'd be great if you could like this video as well. If you did like it I'm just assuming that you assuming that you did um if you're not a subscriber to reaction the main site and you want to read all the work that the team does and you get my weekly newsletter on politics which comes out on a saturday morning explaining hopefully what's uh what's going what's going on uh the link is below become a subscriber at the moment we are um with, with if you become an annual subscriber this month you get a free copy as a welcome gift of the life and reign of Britain's most misunderstood monarch, George III, by the um, brilliant historian Andrew Roberts. It's a really, really good book, and we send it to you as a, as a welcome gift. So become an annual subscriber. My next pick, I think my last pick, is 
something slightly unusual. It's from a, a site which I read uh, read every week from the US. It's called Airmail, uh, which was started by Graydon Carter, who people will be familiar with as the, the the editor of Vanity Fair back in the back in the day. And Airmail, you know, a little bit like, like Reaction, but with a with a US focus, but and they're very interested in culture. Really interesting email that you can sign up to. But they have a, a terrific piece this week by uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg, who um, is a film director, and he directed the original let it be film in 1970 recorded in 1969 and i it's just wonderful to get his perspective i must admit i didn't realize he was still around and so hale and um hale and hearty and to explain for those who don't know what let it be is the film and it's just being re made or recut or turned it all the all the footage is being made into a three a massive sort of three-part project which comes out later this year and the book came out this week um, and looks rather looks rather lovely. I'm certainly going to be buying a copy. But the, the Let It Be project was was essentially when the Beatles, approaching the, the end of their career together, decided, very much a Paul McCartney idea, as Michael Lindsay Hogg explains in the piece, they'd recorded Hey Jude and various other things at uh, and Revolution. They'd recorded videos for those uh, songs at Twickenham Studio, St Margaret's. Um, near where we used to live actually uh, and had had such a good time doing it that they had an idea to return with a live TV special they hadn't pay, played in front of a live audience since 66 uh, um, San Francisco Candlestick Park and Michael Lindsay Hogg gets the, the great gig of recording them rehearsing and uh, the idea is it's going to turn into a TV special the rehearsals it depends how you view it. And apparently this, this new version of the film uh, casts things in a different light. It's always seen by Beatles obsessives like me as the moment in which they really break down and start squabbling among themselves. And it's, it's when the, the Beatles really can run out, of, run out of road and the tensions between McCartney and Harrison are very, um, very apparent. And then it ends, they, they sort of scrap the rehearsals, go to their HQ in Savile Row, and of course, then play the famous rooftop concert, which is, which is seen as their um, seen as their farewell. Though, of course, they then go back into the studio and make um, Abbey Road as a as a as a proper farewell. So, I, I just highlight the piece because it's a lovely, poignant piece by Michael Lindsay Hogg, reflecting on the he was there at the heart of things in the in the sixties, writes beautif beautifully, and it's on airmail. So, I recommend that. So, I think. Is We're it, gonna wrap. Is that the same as the get back Peter Jackson thing? Yes. So get sorry, I should yes. So let it be is, is the original the feature film they did. Get back is the project drawn from 50 hours, 70 hours of rehearsal footage, a lot of it never seen before, or just bootlegged in poor quality. So Jackson's been given everything, all the raw stuff that um Michael Lindsay Hogg filmed at the time and has spent a couple of years going through it all and piecing it together and turning it into this three-part artifact, which I think is on uh, Disney Plus, I, th I think, uh, but coming in, the, coming in the next in the next few weeks. So I can't wait to see it. And I uh, really recommend that piece by Michael Lindsay Hogg uh, in Airmail. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction, just click the um, subscribe button below and um, don't forget to like our video. You've been watching Press Review, the show where we pick apart the stories that have uh, grabbed us in the last week or so, the reaction editors. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Until uh, next time.